I want to share with you today something that might be very valuable to you during this time that we are um, sheltered in place. And it's the renewing of your mind. We all faith-based people are familiar with the scripture, Romans 12 and 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us which mind here that we're to be renewing. And oftentimes, we get caught up in trying to renew our conscious mind. And that's when we make um, vows, we make decisions, uh, uh, we make promises to ourselves that we don't know how to keep, or we make promises to other people that uh, we don't know how to keep. Well, actually, the renewing of the mind here is better understood if we understand that it's the renewing of the, the subconscious mind. Our subconscious mind is pre-programmed for us long before we ever knew uh, what to believe or to question what to believe. We internalized all of the things that were around us and deposited them into our subconscious mind. Now, you may have heard me talk about this before, but the avenue to our subconscious mind, the portals, if you will, is our five senses. So everything that's been deposited into our subconscious mind has come through our five senses. In other words, we've experienced it either virtually or in reality. The subconscious mind really doesn't know the difference. Um, <clears throat> so renewing the subconscious mind is a challenge. It doesn't happen just because we turned over a new leaf. The problem with turning over a new leaf is it's in the same old book and the story ends the same. And we keep the repetitious behaviors with outcomes that um, highly predictable, but hopefully unexpected, but they're there. So we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. We all know what Einstein said about that. Um, so I want to talk about some of the things that, that are in our pre-programming. And we, we refer to them as limiting beliefs, those negative things that we believe about ourselves and oftentimes about the world and about others that are pre-programmed into our subconscious mind. Now, these things that have been deposited becomes part of our belief systems. Now, <clears throat> beliefs drives all behaviors. If you really stop and question why anybody does what they do, it's because of their belief system. Look at our world stage today and the, the uh, things that are happening in the name of God that are atrocious and what would cause people to do that? It's their belief system. Now, we Christians are just as guilty sometimes of faulty belief systems as other religions. And there's, history has shown that even in Christianity, atrocities have been committed. But it was because of the belief system. Now, the way you behave towards your family, your spouse, your children, uh, your, your neighbors, are all based on beliefs, what we believe about them. How we respond is determined by our beliefs. So I want to give you a list of some limiting beliefs that were probably deposited into you at a very early age. Number one, greatness is not something that we should aspire to. Boy, do I remember that one. Um, the verse in Romans 12 is uh, often misapplied. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Boy, there's a false weapon against us believing for God's greatness in us. This is simply a verse that's putting our ego in check and our entitlements in check. But it's been deposited into us. 
Don't try to outshine others. Don't try to uh, be too aggressive, too smart. This keeps us in a bondage that uh, keeps us from ever experiencing everything God wants in our life. And then probably one of the biggest ones is I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough, not educated enough. Uh, on and on and on, we could go with the not enoughs. Those are always based in shame. Now, when shame rules our life, we will never be enough. Remember that ego trip I was talking about a moment ago that's called into check by Scripture? Ego is simply trying to prove that you are enough. Well, the problem with that is enough is never enough. So we have to come to understand that we are enough. Now, as faith-based people, we have a, we have a great uh, foundation for that because it's not based on with God, not based on us being enough. It's based on Christ being enough and us believing in his sufficiency. And thank God that his grace is always sufficient and that his mercies are new every morning, and that his love is unmeasurable. So if you don't think you're enough, put your faith in God that he's made you enough through Christ. Another one is that we're not lovable. There can be a lot of different um, contributors to this. Maybe our parents weren't able to express love in a way that met the need in our lives. And I'm not throwing stones at parents here. I am one. Um, and didn't really know how to love my children enough and to demonstrate it enough. So we start feeling unlovable. And then there's things that happen to us. Sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, any other kinds, physical abuse, always gives us the sense that we're not lovable. Going back to number two, we're not good enough to be loved. And these are beliefs that are ingrained in us and often cause us to compromise uh, valid relationships because we don't think we deserve or that we're good enough to be lovable. Well, thank God, God again demonstrates how lovable we are when he declared, while we were yet sinners, he still loved us. So renewing your mind is getting a new experience, experiencing God's love and allowing yourself to experience other people's love. Number four goes along with that. Um, I'll always be rejected. Rejection is a big, big issue in most of our lives at some time or another. Nobody wants to be rejected and Rejection is often perceived as not being good enough, not being lovable, and um, not being able to maximize our potential. Well, rejection is a big issue, as I said a moment ago. I have to think about this in terms of what rejection really is. Rejection is about not being a fit. This doesn't fit. Particularly in relationships. Every relationship is not going to be a good fit. So rejection is not so much about the person that's being rejected. It's about the person that's doing the rejection on what doesn't fit for them. Really not even about you. It's about them, the rejecter. It's about them, but it's so easy to take that personal. But again, a renewing of the mind that rejection is really not about you. It's about the individual that's doing the rejecting. Now, there's a paradigm shift for you. Um, number five, if I try something new, I'll fail. You know, one of the mantras... In my family growing up, I remember as a kid, was 
be careful, you'll be disappointed. Don't get too excited, you'll be disappointed. It was like disappointment was a fatal blow. Uh, disappointment was something to avoid at all um, expense. Uh, disappointment was bad. Well, the truth is disappointment is not a fatal blow. Disappointment is a teacher. When we're disappointed, we try something new and it doesn't work. It's, and most of the time it doesn't because something new generally requires a new skill set, information that we don't have yet, but it's a learning tool. As we learn to accept disappointment, not as a fatal blow to our ego, not as a fatal blow to our, to our intelligence, but it's simply learning how not to do something so we can learn how to do it. Okay. Number six, success is for other people. Now there's a deep internal subconscious belief system that success is only for others, not for you. Well, success is for you. And you have to start to believe that. And you start by small successes and celebrating them. One of the things that I've learned on my journey uh, in becoming who I am today and teaching what I teach is to learn to celebrate successes no matter how small they are. See, when you learn to celebrate your successes, you're training your brain to look for successes. Now there is the mechanics of renewing the mind. See, the people that only look for failure train their brain to look for failure. It's the difference between the, uh, the law of, of uh, Murphy's Law, sorry, uh, that's going to go wrong, it will go wrong, or the law of the Midas touch. See, people with the Midas touch, that everything they do seems to succeed, is not because they're smarter. It's not because of any other thing than the fact that they have learned to look for success by training their brain to celebrate the smallest successes. When you start celebrating your successes, you're going to start increasing your successes and things are going to improve in your life. That goes along with the next one. I don't deserve to be prosperous. I don't deserve to be happy. Well, I want to use some language from, a, from a, an evangelist, Vance Havener, from another generation. That's a lie back, belched up out of the back alley of hell. He was very colorful in, in his speech and language. Well, it is a lie. You were not created to be unhappy. You were not created just to be broke. You were created to be blessed, created by God in his image. He didn't create us to be failures. He didn't create us to be unhappy. He didn't create us to be anything other than the joy of his life. And he wants us to be happy. So retraining our brain, again, that happiness is a product of healthy choices and a healthy relationships. Now, number nine, my deep-rooted beliefs hold me back. Well, that's true if you want it to be true. I uh, remember a quote from Henry Ford. He said, if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't. He said, both are true. And that truth resides within your belief system. Number 10 has to do with money. If I make money, people won't like me. Now, there's an interesting belief that we need to really uncover and have a new experience. See, if you think that having money will make people not like you, you might have a prejudice against people who have made money and have money. So it's really a 
reflection of how you are experiencing other people. If you want to start believing that it's okay for you to make money, change your attitude toward people that have money. Now, pick some of these and see which ones you want to change. Can't change all of them at once, but you can start with one or two and you can start changing your life by renewing your mind.